morning. It is Tuesday, July 28th, 2015. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, the United States and Turkey agree on establishing an Islamic State free zone along the Syria-Turkey border as Ankara arrests hundreds of suspected IS militants and Kurdish separatists. More than a year after the last attempt to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict collapsed, Labor Minister Hilik Barr presents a new Two States for Two People initiative. We'll take a closer look. And later on the show, a new exhibition will allow you to battle monsters, jump out of a plane, and rattle the tusks of a horse. And of course, get your photo taken while doing it all. Good morning, I'm Yael Avi, and we begin in Turkey today, where yesterday in the early morning hours, Ankara police forces arrested dozens of suspected Islamic State and Kurdish PKK separatists in a major security raid. In northern Syria, Kurdish fighters claimed to have taken the town of Sirin from the Islamic State after a month-long offensive, while simultaneously accusing the Turkish army of shelling their positions in the area. Also yesterday, it was announced that the United States and Turkey will establish an Islamic State free zone along a 60-mile strip of the Syria-Turkey border that would be controlled by moderate Syrian insurgents and could also perhaps provide a partial solution to the Syrian refugee crisis. In the meantime, Turkish Prime Minister Ahmed Avatuglu said that while there are currently no plans for boots on the ground in Syria, the ongoing campaign from the air could change the balance in the region, to quote him in order to try and make sense of this three-way war that bodes very badly, as it seems right now, for a possible autonomous or free Kurdistan in the future. We are joined in studio by I-24 News senior Middle East analyst mm -hmm. Ali Wakid. Ali, good morning to you. Before we break it down, let's take a look at the following report from Turkey and discuss. A crackdown on IS militants, continued airstrikes in neighboring Iraq, and an army now involved outside Turkish borders. Turkey's getting tough. At least 15 people suspected of links to the Islamic State group have been detained after Turkish police raided homes in Ankara in a major security sweep. In the southeastern city of Adyaman, 19 people with alleged links to the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, were also detained. The arrests came after mass protests erupted in the southeast of the country against the strikes on PKK targets. One demonstrator was killed in the standoff with the Turkish army, fueling claims that Turkey is trying to quash pro-PKK protests. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan discussed the escalation with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin on Monday. Meanwhile, Turkish military involvement in neighboring countries continues to deepen. Iraq Turkish fighter jets returned Monday after bombing targets in the mainly Kurdish region of Hakurk in northern Iraq. Sunday night strikes could signal the end of the ceasefire between Turkey and the PKK, signed only in 2013 after nearly three decades of armed struggle. Turkish Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu said the Kurdish insurgency against Ankara is a security threat and the strikes will continue until his country is satisfied that its borders are safe. But a dramatic announcement made Monday could see Turkey expanding its activities even closer to its borders. Syria. Ankara firmly denied today that it had struck Kurdish YPG positions in the north of Syria. The YPG, a self-proclaimed Democratic People's Army, said Turkish tanks hit its positions in the village of Zurmagar in Aleppo, wounding four members of the Allied rebel force and several villagers. Despite Turkey's denial, the country's border with Syria is heating up, also due to a different threat the Islamic State. We have relatives in Syria. We've received a phone call from them. They said the Islamic State had been threatening to launch an assault on them. They got into cars and had to leave. Many of them have left and went to nearby towns. Turkey has dramatically escalated its role in the U.S.-led coalition against the Islamic State group in a move which could shift its position and influence in the Middle East. Joining us via Skype from Jerusalem is Professor of Political Science from Bar Ilan University and the Director of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, Ephraim Inbar. Mr. Inbar, good morning to you. 
Good morning. Um, and of course, we're going to start this discussion in a second. Also joining us over the phone from Turkey, Budrum in Turkey, is journalist, um, a freelance journalist, Laura Wells. Laura, good morning to you. I want good to morning. good morning. I want to refer everybody actually to what Turkey's foreign minister Melvut Kavasuglu said yesterday about the PKK, which actually goes line in line also with the prime minister of Turkey. Let's have a listen what, to what the Turkish foreign minister had to say. So there is no difference between PKK and Daesh. So you cannot say that PKK is better because PKK is fighting Daesh. Why PKK and PYD is fighting Daesh for the the territorial integrity of the Syria or peace in Syria? No, because they want to force certain part of the uh, Syria. They want to control some area. Thus, they fight uh, each other for power. How can you say that this terrorist organization is better because it's fighting Daesh? They are safe. Terrorists are evils. They all must be eradicated. This is what we do. Ali, this is the Turkish foreign minister compare, making a straight comparison between the PKK, that's the Kurdish um, uh, uh, fighters, on that area in Turkey, in that border between Turkey and Syria, and, and IS. Has Turkey, is Turkey using this battle against the Islamic State to ins essentially annihilate any Kurdish aspirations? Absolutely, uh, Yael. And first of all, I'm not sure that the uh, uh, Turkish are really uh, fighting the Islamic State. Uh, we know that the uh, Turkish are still uh, training uh, some uh, Syrian opposition uh, militias, including jihadist uh, op uh, uh, opposition uh, group, and including some elements within the uh, Islamic State. What happened is that uh, a suicide bombing attack took place from a, a group in the uh, Islamic State against Kurdish uh, uh, targets that were also uh, uh, Turkish, but mainly it, the attack was guided against the uh, Kurds, and the uh, Turkish are trying to maneuver between uh, giving the image that they are fighting the Islamic State, but their focus is on the uh, Kurds, and it's not by accident that uh, they uh, bombarded uh, targets of the uh, YPG, which is considered the main instrument of the international uh, coalition in the matter of uh, boots on the ground. These are the instrument of the international coalition to fight the Islamic State on the borders between Syria and Turkey, and we saw that the Kurds are already claiming that uh, the Turkish Air Force bombarded their uh, targets. So in the so-called fight against the Islamic State, the uh, Turkish are maneuvering in order also to weaken every uh, Kurdish uh, power. And I do believe that they don't make a difference between the YPG and between the PKK. Now, Laura Wells joining us from Budrum in, um, uh, in Turkey. Laura, when you're listening to this, the reactions in Turkey when it comes to this renewed, well, not renewed, actually, this new initiative to join the so-called coalition, you know, is there reaction within Turkey from the Turkish people when it comes also to the PKK, or is there complete support behind the Turkish government to, you know, both battle the IS but also take an aim at the PKK on that border? Well, most Turkish people do not want to be embroiled in Syria, actually. They are against ISIS. They do identify that as a terrorist group, and many people in Turkey are terrified of them. That being said, they remember uh, the strife between the PKK and the government over the years. They don't necessarily think that the government is always right, but they are sick and tired of what is going on right now, which is uh, the killing of at least 10 now Turkish servicemen uh, since Monday, last Monday. Um, so a little bit over a week. And, you know, yesterday, so many uh, bomb threats all over Istanbul metro stations. Uh, there are PKK and DHKPC, which is a, another a Marxist-Leninist group. Uh, they're bearing arms in some neighborhoods in Istanbul. Uh, there was another bomb threat um, and the package removed in Gezi Park. It was evacuated yesterday. Uh, so they do believe also that PKK is a terrorist organization. Uh, but they do, again, they do not necessarily want to enter the coalition to fight directly in uh, Syria, but they definitely want to be tough on terrorists, whether it be the PKK or uh, the uh, ISIS in Turkey itself. Right. And uh, as PKK is designated a terrorist group in Turkey and the EU and the United States, uh, there's a lot of support. Uh, to retaliate when PKK does claim the guts of any Turk. Um, in, in Turkey. Now, Professor, <clears throat> sorry, Professor, <clears throat> pardon me, 
Um, uh, and, and, and pardon me, <laughs> just uh, yes, we're moving, moving from joining us via Skype in Jerusalem is the professor of political science in, uh, in Berlin, if I'm in Baal. Professor Inbar, pardon me for I'm, uh, butchering your name at the beginning here. You're looking at the map, you're looking at Turkey Vim, uh, and Syria right there on the border with the Kurdish fighters, putting aside for a second the claim that they're terrorists within Turkey, which can be, of course, understood from the side of the Turkish people. But on the ground, the Kurdish Peshmerga seem to be, from reports that we know, the only ones who are making any gains on the ground against the IS. As a group as such, they are expecting, I am assuming, something in return at the end of the battle against the Islamic State. Is that something in your mind that the international arena can give to the Kurds, i.e., an autonomous stretch of Kurdistan or free Kurdistan as the Kurdish people want? As the international community cannot give anything because it is uh, Kurds that are fighting and if they'll get anything, it's uh, uh, what uh, they'll be able to conquer uh, on their own. And this is precisely why uh, uh, Turkey is feeling uncomfortable. Uh, Turkey has never been uh, comfortable with establishment of a Kurdish state uh, on its borders that uh, might bring about irredentist uh, uh, feelings among uh, its large Kurdish uh, population. And this is uh, why uh, Turkey is acting. I would uh, maybe look also at domestic factors. Uh, we know that uh, last month, uh, the AKP, the ruling party of Erdogan, was not so successful in garnering uh, a majority in parliament and it has negotiated a coalition and with the MHP, which is a nationalist party, and maybe the war against the Kurds will uh, bring uh, the MHP finally into coalition, helping uh, the AKP to uh, form uh, a government and continue to rule in Turkey. But that said, and Laura, actually, this goes back to you. When the reactions or the statements coming out of the Turkish administration saying no points of boots on the ground at this point within Syria, is that something, though, that's in discussion and possibly we'll see in the near future? Because I'm assuming the worry for the Kurdish fighters is that if there are Turkish boots on the ground going into Syria, they won't just fight the IS. I don't think there's a lot of support to put boots on the ground. I don't know if there's a plan. We'll see at the special NATO meeting that was called by Turkey that it will happen later today. Uh, it is true that a lot of Turks are uncomfortable with that PKK affiliate, which is YPG in northern Syria, forming its own country, which they have already declared uh, autonomy at this point. Um, but that being said, I do think that Turks are more comfortable with YPG fighting ISIS in Syria because it's not necessarily in Turkey. On the border, though, that is uh, troubling to some Turkish citizens. That, that's a different story. And Ali, finally to you, though, I want to revert back to this. When I say a promise or something that the Kurdish um, uh, population, the Kurdish people will expect, when this whole b battle against IS culminates, because they are the only ones seemingly making gains on the ground. Um, is there any type of situation in the future? If we're looking at this new deal between the United States and Turkey, how important is it the United States and Turkey are now collaborating? And does it mean, actually, that at the end of this battle, you know, the United States, the big power of the world, will not support any kind of Kurdish claim, do you think? Well, this is the, the, this is the big uh, fear of the uh, Kurds. At the, at the end of the day, the Americans will prefer their alliance with uh, Turkey and bringing back uh, Turkey to the uh, traditional uh, Western uh, uh, alliance, because now Turkey is uh, trying uh, to uh, get closer to the Muslim Brotherhood and to uh, jihadist uh, uh, groups. And even there are talks that after the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, the Turks are examining getting back to their uh, old relations with uh, Iran, and this is the fear of the, the Kurds, that at the end of the day, the Americans will prefer bringing back uh, Turkey uh, to the international uh, community, to the Western international uh, exactly. community, on behalf of the uh, Kurds' uh, uh, interest. And this is why I do agree with uh, Professor Imbar that at the end of the day, uh, the Kurds will negotiate on every uh, piece of soil. They will liberate uh, uh, themselves, and they will be uh, able to conquer and to say, we are here. We're and here we on are the ground. Absolutely Absolutely. And the big question is, what would be in this scenario the place of uh, the Syrian regime and what would be and who would be in the Syrian regime and whether the interest of the Syrian regime will uh, prefer uh, not to give uh, the, the Syrian Kurds uh, 
a piece of uh, the, of Syria of today, and this will, of course, uh, complicate uh, the situation. The still, in spite of all their gains on the ground, this, we cannot say that the Syrian Kurds or the, of course, not the uh, Turkish Kurds are in the same position of the Iraqi Kurds. Of the Iraqi Kurds that have, when we're talking about a place like Erbil, where there's a, where there's an almost an autonomous Kurdistan, but ultimately, I think you know, to conclude this, it is the, the shifting borders of Syria that are being at, that are at play right now um, uh, in that battle um, uh, on uh, on the ground. Ali, thank you um, uh, for being with us this morning on this bit. Of course, we're locking you in studio because we love you. And thank you, everybody, joining us this morning from Turkey and both from Barilan University. <music> Lots of news throughout um, uh, the day on this <clears throat> July. Oh, is it, is it, 28th? it is the 28th and July 28th, 2015, <laughs> and yeah, Ali is smiling because he knew that was right. But here is Ami Kaufman with the rest of the news that you missed while scanning the headlines. Yes, okay, so we're going to start with some stuff from uh, about Obama. Uh, yesterday, as you recall, we talked about uh, Mike Huckabee and uh, his strange yes. uh, Holocaust analogy when he said that Obama is leading Israelis to the oven as a result of the Iran nuclear deal. Well, Obama is, of course, visiting Africa, as we can, as we know. He, uh, and he was in uh, Ethiopia yesterday at Addis Ababa in a press uh, conference. He uh, uh, said that um, uh, these comments were part of a pattern of attacks by Republican candidates that would be, that would be considered ridiculous if it weren't so sad. Yes. It doesn't help inform the American people, this is what he's saying. In, in response to Huckabee using the Holocaust. The Holocaust analogy. I have to say, and again, I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm allowed to say this because I'm Jewish, okay? <laughs> uh, but the, the first um, uh, election campaign of President Obama, mm -hmm. he actually referred to Auschwitz. They keep using the Holocaust in American campaigns. It's awful. Yeah. Um, he referred to Auschwitz and said that it was awful for his uncle to liberate it. Mm. But that said, Auschwitz was liberated by the Red Army. Mm. It was liberated by the Russians. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah, no, Ali's smiling. So <laughs> I think this is my recommendation to every American candidate running. Yeah. Do not touch the Holocaust. Yeah, especially if you don't know the history, right? If you don't right? know it, step away from <laughs> it. Take a step yes. back. Uh, there you go. Uh, that's good advice. Yes. And, um, and Obama is, as I said, in uh, Addis Ababa, and he, he's trying to lead an effort to end the uh, South uh, Sudan War while he's there. He had a meeting with uh, some uh, African leaders there. No, this is a, a, a you know, when South Sudan gained independence about four years ago. This is something that the American administration was very proud about. Oh, quite uh, monumental, they, they, because it's the first meeting also with the African Union. Yes. Right, and, and, they, and you know, but since then, about 18 months ago, civil war started. Tens of thousands of people have been killed. Two million people have been displaced. So he met with uh, some leaders, and uh, uh, they agreed to press uh, the combatants to agree to a peace agreement by <laughs> August 17th. Ooh, and he threatened, he, yeah, and he threatened <laughs> that if both sides uh, don't reach an agreement, then there will be sanctions or other measures if they do not comply. So this could be a pretty good development if we if we see if it has, but the White House officials are not really mm, optimistic about anything, anything happening in this when it regard. Anything comes to Sudan, which, which yeah. is, it's, it's tragic, because this is an ongoing war and conflict killing right. thousands and thousands, thousands which of is, people. Yeah, it's, when it's only mentioned if Obama is there or if George Clooney, you know, <laughs> makes a documentary. Sadly so. Nobody talks about it, right? Exactly. Yes. Our favorite finance minister, <gasps> Yanis Varoufakis, is giving some more details about what happened in those final days before. Is that the uh, New Yorker? Uh, uh, I think so, but yeah. this is actually a piece from the Telegraph. Uh, this is what all of Greece is talking about. There was a plan to go to the drachma. There, there was a par uh, he, there was a secret cell that he was heading, which consisted of five people, only him and five people that worked under him, that hacked into finance government computers, his own ministry computers and drew up plans for a system of parallel payments that could be that could switch from euros to drachmas at the flip of a button. All he was waiting for was a, from a green light from Prime Minister Tsipras to give him the green light. He never got that green light. That is fascinating. It is amazing. It is fascinating. <clears throat> they were, he was just waiting for it. They were working on it for six months. They had a Columbia uh, uh, a tech uh, okay. expert who hacked into, they were hacking already, hacking into the system. And you know what this spells to me is that this, you know, the foreign minister, the resigning foreign minister was actually resolved that that vote, that that no vote, would actually create a Brexit. Yes. But clearly Tsipras wasn't on board. He wasn't on board. Well, he was on board, but apparently Tsipras like really changed in the last few days, and, and then even and after the referendum, and said, no, we're not going to do and this. And that's where I have a feeling Amazing we'll see this story. man running um, uh, for, the, um, uh, so? for the top seat <laughs> Amazing um, uh, in story. Greece at a certain <laughs> point there. Yes. The biggest deal so far that an Israeli company has ever done, it's a mega deal in the pharmaceutical uh, business. Uh, Teva is buying the generic business of Allergan for a deal that is worth $40 billion. This is catapulting Teva into the top 10 list of pharmaceutical companies in the world. It was, first of all, the, the largest generic uh, company right. in the world, and it is buying the third largest generic company, Allergan. It's, it's Allergan's generic business, uh, which makes Botox, by the way. Ah, 
Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, this is this is a massive, That's cutting massive cutting edge deal. medicine right there. Right. Yes. Bobby Christina Brown, the daughter of Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown, died uh, two days ago at the age of uh, 22 uh, in a very similar uh, way. She's, she was in a coma for in about six months. In an eerily months. similar way. Very yeah. eerily similar way. Also found in her bathtub, and she died uh, uh, just uh, two days ago. We have a report about that. We have a report. The entire world, or I think the, you know, uh, North America is dealing with this. Let's take a look. She was just 18 when her mom drowned in a bathtub at the Beverly Hilton, just 22 when she wound up face down in her own bathtub in Georgia, unconscious. That was six months ago. Bobby Christina Brown never woke up again. An autopsy completed today, inconclusive. Still an open investigation. Bobby Christina grew up before our eyes. An infant when Barbara Walters sat down with Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown. You want more children? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Especially after seeing her. After her mom's tragic death, she opened up to Oprah. Yeah. Some days harder than others. Very much so. So different from the future she told Diane Sawyer she dreamed of. Sitting, looking at my daughter grow up. Instead, a heartbreaking ending. I love you. Yeah. Very sad. No, very sad. And I think, you know, Oprah just tweeted, I think, yeah. yesterday, I'm uh, finally at peace. There are now reports also that there's going to be an autopsy. Yeah, um, TMZ uh, is reporting that this is a homicide probe now, and her boyfriend, Nick Gordon, is called a person of interest. Oh, so this could t change into something totally different than what people are <clears throat> Yeah, though, I mean, I think just the tragic of this is is a young kid very distraught with, right. you know, on, on drugs, sadly. Yeah. Yes. And if we're just quickly for staying with the, the music industry, I guess the father of uh, Michael Jackson, Joe Jackson, was in Brazil celebrating his 87th birthday. He suffered a stroke. This is actually his third stroke. Uh, he lost his sight, apparently, and he has a regular heartbeat. So uh, let's hope so, that he yeah. gets better. Um, he seems more dangerous in the Middle East, the music industry in the right, state. Yes. Right. Yes. New York Magazine. I think they might actually get the Pulitzer Prize for this one. Let's look at the, uh, the cover Please. of New York Magazine yesterday. Uh, uh, for, uh, 35 wow. women. 35 women who were um, sexually harassed, or some of them apparently, you know, uh, uh, raped, by Bill Cosby, uh, they, uh, New York Magazine uh, spoke to 35 women of the 46 who have complained against him. This is an amazing, ama they all testified and uh, gave testimony in this issue of New York Magazine. Uh, there's some videos on the website as well that you can see. Um, hey, this is gonna be bad because yeah. <clears throat> there's so much public pressure, I think, or so much media pressure in the United States against Cosby, which is also very, very sad. I mean, the mm -hmm. stories are seem quite valid. There can't mm -hmm. be that many, I mean, I don't wanna, one should not take sides before somebody's proven guilty. Mm -hmm. But it's just the sordid, sad thing right. of a career where of, of somebody who I think in the Western culture, you correct me if I'm wrong because you have children as well, was like the guru of parenthood. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you know what? It was going on for 20 years. For I 20 mean, years. I mean, nobody was talking. It's just... No, and one thing needs to be also, I'm sorry, quite honest and say, excuse me, but in Hollywood and in the media business in the United States, mm -hmm. I don't think this is the only story. Oh, no. And this is being crucified on the top right. of the hill. Yes. And it was interesting yesterday. I tried to uh, get into the site, New York Magazine, and it was down. Apparently, there was a reason for this. If we t take a look at this headline from Gawker, it was hacked. There was a DDoS attack uh, by, by a racist hacker called Threat King. Nobody could get into the site and see this stuff on New York Magazine. And uh, the reason he said this is because he hates New York. He, oh. he, he, I went to New York two months ago. It was really bad. Someone pranked <laughs> me. Everyone started laughing. The first 10 hours being there, some African-American oh. tried to prank me with a fake handgun. The site was down for, I think, about six hours on probably the most important day of this website. Yes, no, no, entirely, entirely. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm buying this as somebody who hated New York. This is, this might be somebody from the Daily News. I'm kidding, <laughs> but uh, no. Oh, wow, yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was pretty, okay. Um, Bangladesh, uh, there was a new census uh, that, uh, where they're counting uh, tigers in Bangladesh. They thought there were about 400, 500 tigers. Now they're basically on the verge of extinction. Probably only about 100 left, we have a report. Let's take a look. You are trying my patience. Searching for Baloo, Bagheera, Ka, Shere Khan, and all the other animals in the Jungle Book, Bangladesh may be the place to find them. It's home to the world's largest mangrove forest, the Sundarbans. But it has far fewer endangered animals than previously thought. This is a tiger habitat. This is the area where they should live, because in the past, this was a protected area. In 2004, conservationists thought some 440 tigers lived in the World Heritage Listed Forest, one of the world's last remaining habitats for big cats. 
But a survey taken this year found only an average of 106 tigers. So what went wrong? The drop may be explained by the methodology used this time around. Hidden cameras, rather than a pug mark tracking system, gave a much more accurate figure. Experts are calling on authorities to better protect the cats. Poaching and rapid development around the forest's edges are causing the numbers to shrink, and fast. They blame human encroachment on the animal's habitat for rare cases of deadly tiger attacks. The natural forest where elephants live is being disrupted and destroyed. It's also the main reason behind the conflict between humans and tigers. The tiger's habitat is decreasing and so is their prey. So the tigers enter the villages looking for food. Half a century ago, some 40,000 tigers roamed the region. Now, the few that are left are fighting for survival. And if nothing is done, they could disappear altogether. That's sad news. No, that is sad. Um, yeah. <sighs> I can't believe that depressed me more than all the wars in the Middle East. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's even sadder. Well, do you want to end on a lighter uh, Can note? we? <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. yes, please. Talk about a first date from hell. Two oh. young people went decided to go on a hike, and this is in, in Los Angeles, Los Angeles National Forest. They went okay. on a hike for their first date. First date. Why do that on a first Never date? Never, yeah. They you took want maps, to the they took- shop, secure. They took, yeah. <laughs> they took <laughs> maps, they took water, they got lost. They got lost. <laughs> they tried to find a, a reception for their cell phones that they called the sheriff's station, and, and they got airbussed out by, 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 a, by a helicopter, had to rescue them. See the copper, the I chopper? I have to say that this looks like they're both <laughs> dating the cop now. Yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> they're, 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 some people are saying on the web that maybe this guy actually planned this from the start so he could get a chopper view of LA on his first date, his a romantic first date. First date. Although I'm the, wondering, this is something that if it happens in the first day, I would on the first date I would venture and say that these two should marry each other. That's what I was thinking. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. Do you think they're going to make it? They're going to. I think they're with the first it. date like that. They're yeah, like, with the first date <laughs> like that, you, you can't really like listen. You can't go you know, wrong. If we went through this, yeah. I just uh, want to say, by the way, I did, in this press review, I did not mention Donald Trump. Did you notice that? You did not. <laughs> did you notice that? <laughs> you did not mention Donald Trump once, once. and I will remind you that he. He's still leading in the polls right. of the Republicans. Terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, do stay with us um, uh, when we get back. A closer look at another yet refreshed initiative to try and re kickstart the peace process between Israel and, Pal Israel and Palestine, or a possible future Palestine. Stay with us. We'll take a closer look. First, of course, as in every morning, the morning headlines. I-24 News Morning Edition on this July 28th, 2015 might be the time to discuss again something everybody has forgotten about and that is the prospects of a peace between Israel and the Palestinian. Speaking of the prospects for peace between Israel and the Palestinians, they've seldom looked as poor as they do these days. Israelis recently voted in a government dead set against surrendering land for peace headed by a prime minister who pays lip service to the two-state solution, but has done little to advance it, according to critics from the left about him. Now, the Palestinians, meanwhile, are pursuing other avenues for recognition, as we all know, through international bodies, and their leader is supposedly so tired of his job, he's considering retirement, but that, too, of course, is yet to be two-sourced. The international community is distracted by regional wars. Putin and the Iran nuclear deal and the United States seem reluctant to take up the reins again. So. Enter a man by the name of Yechiel Chilik Bar, a mid-level parliament member from the Labour Party. Our diplomatic reporter, who is here in studio with me, of course, Tal Shalev, good, good morning. morning to you, was there to attend yesterday an unveiling of his new diplomatic framework for peace, which he hopes will pick up where John Kerry's failed last year. Let's first watch the report and break it down from there. It's been 15 months since the last attempt to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict collapsed, meaning 15 months of almost total stalemate. After the signing of the nuclear agreement with Iran, international pressure to change the status quo between Israel and the Palestinians is looming. The topic is climbing its way back to the top of the international agenda, and the Israeli political system is weighing in on the topic as well. Netanyahu prefers to bury and cancel any initiative. He wants to keep the situation as it is and just continue to preach the slogan that there is no partner and no chance and no one to move forward with. 
A new diplomatic framework for reaching the goal of two states for two peoples was revealed at a special event in the Israeli parliament on Monday. The plan was initiated and designed by Chilik Bar from the Labour Party, also known as the Zionist Union, and is the product of two years of brainstorming with dozens of Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs and international figures. If the government is doing nothing and uh, we have a freezing in the uh, state issues, diplomatic issues between us and the Palestinians and the Palestinians are running around the world trying to suggest things, I think that Israel should have a her own initiative. We are trying to offer it to the government or as an opposition uh, offer. This is our duty in order to prevent the one-state solution and to promote a two-state solution, which is the only uh, good solution for us and for the Palestinians. Don't expect any groundbreaking clauses. In many ways, the framework is more of the same. A demilitarized Palestinian state based on 1967 borders with mutual land swaps, settlers will be able to stay under Palestinian sovereignty. Jerusalem stays united, but both sides can call it their capital and a positive Israeli response to the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative. Since its March 17 election defeat, the Labour Party has been gradually veering to the political center, even winking at the right. The new peace plan might not bring an end to the conflict, but it is definitely part of the party search for a new identity. Tal Shalev, I-24 News, Jerusalem. Talshalev, of course, with us in studio, also joined by Dr. Hani Zubeda from the Political Science Department at the Israel Valley College. Good morning to you. Good morning. First, though, to the lady in the studio. Of course. Okay, the initiative that, you know, pardon me for being uh, sarcastic, you know, and, and raising an eyebrow, but as you said, Emma, off camera, the press was there more than actual, um, uh, more than actual members or Arab MKs to join into this initiative being um, uh, introduced. What stands behind it? Does it even stand a chance these days? Well, uh, Chilik Bar is one of the most active uh, Israeli lawmakers on this issue, on this topic of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. He is the head of the two-state caucus in the Knesset, and we have to give it to his credit that he has been actively pursuing it, persistently pursuing um, this topic since he's been elected. And uh, every once in a while, he tries to promote or bring up the issue, and that is more that we can say about more um, most of the 120 lawmakers in right. the Israeli parliament. No, so true. in the past two years, he has been working on this initiative that basically if we want to be frank and we want to be candid, it takes little parts of different initiatives that have been circulated around uh, the region in the past years and puts them together. Like but but yeah. the idea and but the the idea behind what he is saying, and that might be the most important thing, is that Israel needs to take an initiative. Need, Israel needs to present an initiative because international pressure will be coming back. We all we are already seeing it coming back as the Iran deal is uh, on its way to be concluded. The European are interest are um, in expressing more interest and the US is gearing up um, for September for the UN General Assembly that will probably be the platform when we understand what is going to be the face of the Israeli Palestinian peace process in the upcoming months why do we think this is um, when you when we're talking about the international arena because Mogherini visiting now Saudi Arabia um, trying to create this new initiative that you will tell us about shortly but why do we think this is not just rhetoric from the re from the international community when it comes to the Israeli Palestinian um, uh, efforts well, First of all, there is a lot of Palestinian pressure to move forward and to to do something, and the Palestinians are moving forward. In the past few weeks and months, they have um, toned down their international attempts. But basically, if we look at what has happened in the past year, we've had various parliaments recognize Palestine in a unilateral way. We have the Palestinians submit um, their membership to the ICC. A lot is going on, and uh, the Palestinians, the Israelis, everyone understood that until the Iran deal is over, there's nothing um, to do. In, this, uh, in that respect, and everyone is waiting for the so-called American reevaluation and re reassessment to be concluded. By the way, according to American officials, that hasn't been concluded yet because the administration has been so engaged in the Iran deal. So basically, everyone is waiting for the Americans to say their word. But in the in the meanwhile, we hear both the uh, the, the French, who are very keen on pr on promoting their initiative, the EU, who adopted basically the French initiative uh, last week. And basically, they are keen on trying uh, to use the time in the meanwhile to find a formula that can restart negotiations. That can restart negotiations. Dr. Hani Zubeda, I want to touch with you on the fact you sat here throughout the election process that the Israeli people went through not a long while ago. You actually said to me once off camera that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in this term, is the only one who is capable of actually restarting this peace process between Israelis and Palestinians. Cue in the left from Israel, though. Why should, why can this, if you think that this can work at this point? 
point. And what is, you know, the thing that's baffling to me is, why now? Why didn't we hear this from the Israeli left throughout the election campaign? Well, I think the Israeli left kind of like lost his way through the elections, but it's not the first time. It has been going on for a certain time. Uh, if we go back, the last time the Israeli left was proactive in this notion was the Oslo Accord and the Rabin government. Right. Ever since the Israeli left is trying to find his way, let me remind you that in the last election campaign, not this one, the one previous to that, uh, Shelly Echimovich completely, the head of the Labour Party, completely dropped Drop the, the Palestinian issue. Yes. So we, we hear nothing from the left in that Concern. Nothing from the main party of the left. I should say Meretz and the joint uh, list are saying a few things. few things, but the yeah. main bulk, the one that draws the Well, the, the votes. main bulk is the Labour Party, which is, I think, trying to find its new way. It's trying to become the new Labour of the right. Israeli politics, but they're not succeeding. L let me just say that. If we look at Benjamin Netanyahu, he's the only parliament member from the Likud who said twice, we need to strive for a sol two-state solution. The only one. The first was the Bar-Ilan uh, speech. Uh, speech, and then secondly, in, in this campaign, where he said two-state solution, he recanted. Um, uh, but he's also the man, though, I have to remind you, that stood on that Facebook page and said that under his regime, there'll never be a Palestinian yes, state. Yes, so we so, see, yeah. so we see, we this, see, the, we yeah. see this kind of like on and off issue. I think the problem is that the guideline is the Oslo Accord, but Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't really like the Oslo Accord. Ever since the Oslo Agreement, what we saw is Israel not proactive. Israel is only reacting yeah. to situations. We saw the disengagement from Gaza. We saw the continuation and the discontinuation of building in Judea and Samaria. And now what we see, I think, we see the next phase. As soon as the Iran issue will settle down, the dust will clear. I think that all the Europeans and all the Americans, not just the French, not just the German, all of them will concentrate on this because they feel this is the, th the sore thumb of the Middle East. They feel that if Israel and Palestine will reach an agreement, this will be an issue that will kind of like come down the Middle East. One more issue. A lot of people are talking about two-state solutions. Right. Some of the people here in Israel are talking about one-state solution, which is a completely different notion. And we have to take it into consideration, because the minute this agreement will be signed, and the minute the Palestinians will be naturalized, this state, the state of Israel, will probably lose its distinction as the Jewish state. Right. And I think this needs to push forward some of the people who believe that this state should stay the Jewish state. That, is, that it should stay the Jewish state. But that said, it, it actually leads me to think also what happens on the Palestinian side. Because this initiative, and, and, and valid, fascinating point, also has to have some form of reception on the other side. And mm -hmm. joining us on the phone is former Palestinian Minister for Prisoners Affair, Ashraf al -Ajrami. Ashraf, good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, I'm assuming that this was her, you know, was this actually even react? was there any type of reaction to this new initiative of a two-state solution for two people within the Palestinian Authority of Khilikam, uh, you know, of this me uh, member of the, of the Labour Party? I think until this moment, the only solution that the uh, majority of the Palestinian people uh, uh, support is the two-state solution. Based on uh, the Arab Peace Initiative and the, uh, all the international uh, terms of reference uh, uh, of the peace process, which is started uh, by uh, uh, Madrid talks and after that Oslo uh, Accords, these, these are the references that the Palestinian people uh, 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 things that the international community uh, supports and uh, we can reach. Uh, also, there is a uh, majority on the Israeli side. So, but, 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 uh, putting aside, but Mr. al putting aside those initiatives, because at this point we know there was no talking except for, as we've just heard several days ago, several days ago that Israeli um, uh, Likud member, actually, from government, Silvan Shalom, has been meeting with Saib Arakat in Jordan over the course of the last several weeks. Firstly, what is the reaction to that? Are we seeing some sort of a kickstart, you know, from within the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority right now to start negotiations with those meetings? Uh, until this moment, we can't speak about uh, a negotiation between the two sides because the Palestinian uh, leadership uh, uh, doesn't want to return to the uh, uh, 
bilateral uh, uh, negotiations between uh, the Palestinian leadership and the Israeli government because this kind of the negotiation failed totally to reach any kind of uh, uh, um, result in, in the, the peace process. So we, we want here to uh, make the international community uh, intervene in the uh, uh, the process, uh, but the Palestinian leadership uh, wants to know if there is a change in the Israeli side uh, and what uh, uh, try, uh, um, Tilzan Shalom tries to uh, say to the Palestinian leadership is there is a change in the Israeli government and there is a partner and they want to reach uh, results of this start. A negotiation. We want to uh, have uh, some kind of guarantees because it is not popular for the Palestinian people to, re to start or restart an again. Another, an uh, another round of a 20-year-old yes. uh, discussions. But, you know, speaking of the people, Dr. Zubeda, you know what, the, the people of Israel, for example, because I think there's also a fatigue on the Palestinian side. Do the people of Israel really care anymore about that, about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Well, they do, but in a kind of like opposite way of what we thought or expected to happen uh, 50 years after the occupation. Um, the Israeli people now are fed up with the fact that, well, it's kind of like a seesaw game, which just now the minister said, they're looking for a partner and they're saying there's no partner. And the Israeli people are looking for a partner and saying that there's no partner. So it's a game of no partner. But this is what we have. There is nothing else. There's nobody else to negotiate with. This needs to be understood. There's a right government and there is the PLO. How can that be understood with both leaders on both sides keep saying that, that exact line that you're saying? Well, there's a growing understanding that even though it's the two sides that need to negotiate, it has to be bolstered by a larger formula. And that is why we're seeing Rather Mogherini. Than just the United States. Just yes. the United States. That's why we're seeing the Mogherini uh, go to Saudi Arabia. This follows meetings that the quartet uh, um, uh, envoys held in recent weeks, both in jo Jordan and in Egypt. There is an um, attempt to create some kind of quartet plus international yeah. forum that includes As more we European saw in the Iran states. As we saw in the Iran negotiations, but it will include Arab states, and it will probably include a demand for Israel to endorse um, in some way the Arab peace initiative. We are hearing more and more positive comments about the 2002 Arab peace initiative. And just to add one more point about the partner issue, in recent weeks following the developments, the political developments in the Palestinian Authority, you're hearing more and more European diplomats and American diplomats raise eyebrows also on the, on the political conduct of uh, the Palestinian president and understanding that it might not be just that the Netanyahu is the problem, but that Abbas also in his uh, um, internal political um, upheavals that he's mm -hmm. trying to control is also could be an obstacle to also peace. Also could be an obstacle to peace, but that said, let's not be ye of little faith and possibly we'll see something come September. I think that would be the time to look at these possible negotiations. Dr. Zubeda, I want to thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be thank you to for have you with me. us in studio. Tal Shalev, enough said. But when we get back, a new exhibition will allow you to battle monsters. It's an entirely different story. Stay with us and keep your cell phone open. First, as in every morning, let's hear the morning headlines. back. It is still Tuesday, July 28th, 2015. This is still the morning edition on I-24 News. Thank you for staying with us, and you should have. Because you have, if you ever wanted to challenge the laws of physics by climbing the walls of a building like Spider-Man, flying in the sky like Superman, or changing in size like Alice in Wonderland while battling monsters and meeting a friendly boars. Yes, yes. This next segment is for you. The Trick Art Exhibition, currently held in Tel Aviv, allows its visitors to take an interactive part in it with the help of visual illusion and airbrushing techniques. And, befitting of the selfie generation, taking photos is emphasized as an integral part of the experience. So, so much so that the exhibition lighting is perfectly adapted for creating these precious, precious Kodak moments, be it Kodak or another company. So first, we have to explain all of this by actually going live to the location of that exhibition, where I-24 News correspondent, intrepid correspondent, Tal Heinrich, who we sent to do the craziest things, is standing by, or rather hanging by, yes, 
There, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Tal, I'm, yes. Tal Heinrich, you have to explain Hi to us. <laughs> yes. First of all, you are getting an Emmy and a Pulitzer for this one. Where are you? What are you? Oh, my word. Yes, bravo. Okay, we're taking, first of all, where are you? What is going Hi on there? Al. Yes. Well, I survived this uh, lava here behind me. Um, welcome to Trick Art Exhibition. And as you said, Yale, Trick Art is in fact an art technique which takes uh, flat objects, two dimensions objects, and turns it into 3D as I uh, presented before. Yes. So what's interesting uh, in this exhibition is that the children are supposed to take an active part and interact with the content like this big child here did before. <laughs> and um, as you can see here next to me, the, the parents are supposed to take the picture, the best and the right picture uh, of their children so wow. they can view it after and be thrilled. And uh, by every nearby every painting, you can see the right instructions of how to take the best photo which is very, very important nowadays if you bring your kids to such uh, an exhibition. Of course. So basically you can be in the middle of the jungle, getting eaten by, by a dinosaur, or, or getting cooked as dinner by savages. <laughs> And uh, I'm joined here by Mr. Moti Shemesh, <laughs> the manager, the artistic manager of, of the artistic part of this exhibition. Hello, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. So uh, tell us, how long did it take you to paint all this? How many were you? Um, we were uh, like uh, seven painters mm -hmm. and uh, we did it uh, in three months. It was a uh, very little time to do this uh, kind of exhibition because usually in the world now it's a big trend and uh, all exhibitions have something like seven months to one year to make the exhibition. So mm -hmm. we had only three months. So where did this idea come from? Uh, as I said, it's a very big trend now r around the world and uh, 3D art is uh, making his, uh, its steps to uh, museums and uh, galleries, so it's, uh, not, um, it's not new, but uh, it's the first Israeli uh, kind of exhibition. And I gotta ask you this, I believe you're getting really positive uh, feedback from children and their parents, but is there also um, some criticism about art mixti mixing with, with the selfie generation and everything is about smartphones and uploading to Instagram? Yeah, some people um, maybe see it uh, as something not very good, but... Um as an artist, I can say that it's, it's amazing because when we usually go to an exhibition, we're going to see and observe. But this time you're going to uh, to an exhibition and you become a part of it, you participate. So I think um, most people really enjoy it because they they want to be a part of the, uh, of the art. They want to be something that usually they cannot be, like a super agent. Oh, I know we lost that there for a second. I'm hoping it's going to come back very shortly because I live, Ami, I really yeah. live for seeing Tal Heinrich. Yeah, essentially, yeah, immersed in, yeah. We promise you that basically she was being eaten right now yeah. by a walrus um, that was jumping behind her, but this should be back shortly, yeah, we we'll hope. Get her back. No, no, I know, we're gonna get it back. <laughs> uh, with, 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 a, with a slight trick for this selfie generation, I find this horrifying. I wanna actually see my child in the mouth. The of, the of, the, of the dinosaur, of the dinosaur yeah. yeah, and then use it as threats before yeah. dinner. But be a, yeah, before very we good usage of that, think? I think yeah, yeah that might work. Before we continue with this, I think we should actually start with the web review that is the spiral viral. That let's yeah, do that. That is what you're here for. I know. Let's How, do that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Or in other words, we have technical issues, so we're going to go to the web <laughs> to the web review. Oh, yes. so that's what they call it these days. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, so. Uh, uh, a while ago, we were talking about the Bill Cosby, and he was, you know, the fall of America's dad. He's not America's dad anymore. He's, he's got, you know, there was one cover in the North Post called America's Rapist. Oh, my God. Now we're talking about America's wrestler. This is the most famous wrestler, oh, in, not only in America, probably the world, the world, Hulk Hogan, who was fired from the WWE. Oh, yeah, and, a, and a politician also. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, who was fired from the WWE, the World uh, Wrestling Entertainment uh, Body, for using the N-word in a series of, um, actually, a sex tapes. It's a kind oh, of complicated, of God. but let's see the story we have report about it. Let's take a look. This morning, the most famous professional wrestler of all time is no longer a WWE Hall of Famer. Hulk Hogan, for now, just another gym rat. Spotted this weekend with his wife on their way to work out in Clearwater, Florida. 
Hogan has been body slammed by his own words eight years ago in a racist outburst complete with the N-word caught on tape. The WWE saying in a statement, we are committed to embracing and celebrating individuals from all backgrounds. The swiftness with which the WWE made the decision to scrub Hogan from the website and their Hall of Fame has surprised some, especially because Hogan was such a face of the organization for so many years. The recording is the first big bombshell from the court filings of Hogan's $100 million libel suit against Gawker Media. Hogan is suing the website for posting a sex tape of him with the wife of his then best friend, a Florida DJ named Bubba the Love Sponge. Hogan quickly apologized for the rant, saying in a statement, it was unacceptable for me to have used that offensive language. There's no excuse for it, and I apologize for having done it. This weekend, Hogan's friends and family tweeted support for the wrestling legend. And last night, Hogan retweeted the following. Biracial President Obama uses N-word and is applauded and keeps his job. Hulk Hogan uses N-word, is vilified, and loses his job. David Wright, ABC News, New York. Please, you start. Obama, that is the worst false you know, equivalence ever that I've ever seen. Obama used the N-word in, in an in interview with Mark Maron on the WTF podcast exactly. in order to use it as a lesson to say how there is still racism in America. Exactly. You just use this, you know, in a sex tape or... or in a sex tape? How do you even I mean, get there? Yeah, but th <laughs> I think it goes to show... First of all, Fallen Heroes, I think, would be the theme of this summer for the United States. Yes. If it's Bill Cosby and you're looking back at things like... I, we were mentioning, I was mentioning to you, Lance Armstrong, the totally. big faux pas. Mm -hmm. Bill Cosby, for the Bill love Cosby, of God. Of yes, horrific. Amazing. Yeah, but... And I just want to remind you that Hulk Hogan, okay, he was, I don't... I, governor of... Whatever. He went into politics and people do vote for that. That, mm -hmm. I would say way of thinking or you know extreme mm -hmm. way of thinking that we in other parts of the world that have their own ailments mm -hmm. um, find shocking yes amazing I don't know what to say yes. um, this is on to a real sportsman but he, this 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 sportsman just angers me uh, this is from Deadspin this is a guy called Gianmarco Tamberi he's an Italian high jumper if we can just see the picture yeah. The, the only thing that is unique about him is that he wears half a beard. Yes. Why? Why is he doing that? Is he doing that just to piss me off? I'm sorry. This is my language. <laughs> but this is just annoying. <laughs> is that too early I in the morning? Know. I will take this one step further. Okay? I will take this one. Why is he sporting a hairstyle? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Look at the hairstyle. Yeah. Let, let's look. At, okay, I get the beard. I don't get. I agree. It's, Thank you. Okay. No, I don't get it. It's done to piss you, Ami Compton, yeah. specifically off. <laughs> Thank you very off. much. Yeah, but the hair. The hair. Come on. It's like Barry you, Manilow. Oh, that's it good. Is. Barry Manilow. It's Manilow. 70s Barry Manilow. 70s Barry Manilow. It's like, do you like pina colada? Okay, the Copacabana yes. song? Bingo. Uh, no, that's what it looks like. I see him like. doing that. <laughs> yes, I don't know. That on. just made me very we, angry. That's the only like reason. This. We're upset. We don't like it. Yeah, we don't. Okay. Ed. Do you remember the shoes that Converse made, the legendary shoes called uh, the, the Chuck Taylors? They've been around for almost 100 years. Really? Almost 100 years. This we is are? Well, no, the shoes <laughs> okay. have been here for almost 100 years. Yeah. Um, if we could see a picture of them from the Washington Post, they, you know, they're considered a, a basketball shoe, rebellious teen uniform, cultural icon. Or as we know them, all-stars. All-stars here in Israel, they call them all-stars. Exactly. But the, the one thing that they have not been, and that is comfortable. They have never been comfortable <laughs> for almost a hundred years, and now yes. the company Converse is about to change that. They're going to use, they're going to be uh, more support. They're going to be lighter, and they're going to use technology from the parent company Nike, and they're going to cost about seventy-five bucks, and they're going to have arch support. But this is already getting people angry. They're apparently Chuck Taylor purists. They're called oh, for they're called Chuck heads. <laughs> They're called yeah, Chuckheads. Who would want to be called a Chuckhead? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they're like, what? We want to be uncomfortable. We want, yeah, exactly. We, they like, they, and we, they like the shoe falling apart. That was also one of the things that the shoe kind of falls apart falls very apart. easily. Yeah, very, very and easily. And the tape gets. Yeah, all, yeah. yeah. No, don't you remember that time in high school where everybody had to have one of those? I think I, I have. Yeah, felt for that. I have I them in, in shocking pink, I have to yeah. say. Yeah, it's kind of like your shirt. But these will actually be. <laughs> but, yeah. You, these you, you made me lose my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a moment. <laughs> yes, and... <laughs> okay, remember a few, uh, I think a few weeks ago, uh, I, I brought you an item about my favorite uh, internet dog, Doug the Pug. Doug the Pug. Doug the Pug, didn't, did, he, he, he went to, uh, dressed up as Kim Kardashian back about, about a month ago. Now he's dressing up as um, uh, Taylor Swift. And uh, this, yes. is, this is what Mashable does in their spare time, Mashable people. <laughs> let's check out the video of uh, Doug the Pug. Doug the Pug doing, dressing up, doing Taylor Swift. Taylor doing Taylor Swift. Okay, let's take a look. He 
is a rock star, I'm telling you. He I is love... a rock star, and it makes me really think, first of all, that Taylor Swift shot with the cat. That's nice. Yeah, um, but I, oh look, they're massaging his face. I want to see, in the, yes. Yeah, I love the hair yeah, there. Yeah, man. Bad <laughs> yes. Luck. Okay. No, Perfect. I'm all for, it. listen, I'm all for, because she is like this amazing businesswoman, and she's 12, I'm all for making a bit of fun of that for us in our mid-40s who are not making that much money. That's right. Um, yes. Oh, I love so that massage. I could use one of those massages right I now. Oh, I'll do that for you by the end of the show. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward. And Brigitte Bardot <gasps> is back in the news. You know, the Australian government is planning to kill to terminate the lives of two million feral cats. And there's a reason for this. They're trying Why? to Okay, there's a reason. They're trying to, to help the existence of 20 different uh, uh, um, species that are under threat of extinction, and they think that these cats are the problem. So they're going to kill so two... So they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna extinct, gonna, yeah. basically... It's a, a five-year plan to kill two million cats all over Australia, and Brigitte Bardot is saying, this is animal genocide, is inhumane and ridiculous. In addition to being cruel, killing these cats is absolutely useless, since the rest of them will uh, keep breeding. So, yeah. Brigitte, yeah. No, no, Brigitte Bardot, I think, you know, the face for, and you know, for right. the battle against animal cruelty, then, you know, there, there we have it. Yeah. But, Ami, it is the time to ask. Do we have time to go yes, back to Tal? Yes, we have to go back to Tal Heinrich. Tal, Let's do where it. are you standing now? <laughs> I'm busy fighting zombies at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> as you can see. Yes, no, 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 completely. As we can see, and, and, and yes, yeah. No, no, hold on, because I'm like, this looks right now. You cannot see this, but this looks right now exactly as if you're being tasered. I don't know, honey, if fighting the zombies just with your little palm is going to fly. But my question to you, Tal, is have you taken enough selfie pictures? Because the beauty of this thing, and if you're right there, are you seeing children or parents taking pictures of their children in these horrific situations? Yes, in fact, um, the exhibition just opened to the audience, and uh, some kids are here. I can actually um, show you yes. some of them trying to do the trick that I did before, and I did much better than them, <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty here. Oh, As you can see, the kid is struggling here. A parent is taking her photo. Wow. And, um, yeah, no. Well, this is the new generation kind of exhibitions, right? No, completely. And tell, I, I want to tell you, first of all, yes, you did bravo, a slightly... Bravo, bravo, bravo. Yes, yes, there you go. No, you did a slightly better job than her because you are a kid at heart. And Tal Heinrich, I just want to tell you that you are an amazing, intrepid reporter, and I demand that you come back with many, many selfies. As we said, this exhibition is taking place in Tel Aviv, in Israel, right now. It's the 3D selfie um, uh, exhibition. Tal Heinrich, you are a rock star. Thank you for this morning. And Ami, really, really, qu really quickly to oh. you, because you have one more, yeah, yeah one, one more. Just a few shots of the, these amazing tattoos artists called the Thieves of Tower. The, what's interesting about them is that they use kind of two parts of the body sometimes. We can just see, see some pictures of it. Really yes. interesting art. Oh. I, I, and, they're, and they're a very popular Instagram account where they show what they do. So that's somebody uh, who's actually taken, you know, has 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 subjected their body to doing yeah. this three. Wow. Yeah, but it's really interesting, you know, kind of like industrial and. Uh, Whoa! A little bit. Yeah, no, that, that's being a human painting in many ways. Again, well, I, I think we should, you know, so, you know I I think we should send Tal Heinrich to try and do that. I think because she'd be willing. I, I think, think I she'd be feeling, really you know, willing to do that. Yeah. All the time that we have. <laughs> Thank you for being with us on this part. When we get back, culture. Stay with us. First, the morning headlines, headlines as in every morning. It's Tuesday. I'm losing my words. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, I-24 News Morning Edition on this July 28th, 2015, and I love summer because I get to be flanked by two men wearing fabulous outfits. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, okay, before we start with anything, Shai, yeah. I'm liking the shirt. Thank you. It's more, it's slightly more kind of dumbed <laughs> down, yeah, as opposed to a man who takes a chance. Like Daniel, I mean, you've tried the jacket, but you cannot really hide the Hawaiian, or what is it? This is actually it's, more Mexican, It's I more say. Mexican, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah take, no, very, very nice, <laughs> very, very nice. Never mind Thank you. you. We're, yes. Oh, and wait, look at me, the hair, the hair. Nice. I, my problem with men who have hair that's longer than mine, 
Is that <laughs> <laughs> seriously? Is that you're stealing my thunder? That said, Shy Ringle, yeah. the man, the tube, the technical genius and geek. What do you have oh, for no. us today? Yes. Um, okay, let's talk about Jeep because because uh, we must. It's, no, it, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but Jeep is recalling Fiat Chrysler, the owners of Jeep, yes. uh, uh, are recalling 1.4 million cars. Uh, around the world because of a technicality which is uh, the possibility that your car will be hacked yeah ah! yeah wired <laughs> uh, uh, published a very interesting story uh, two hackers came to wired and said look we developed an uh, an app that can hack Jeep Shiroki we'll sit in ha our home you'll drive your Jeep Shiroki and you'll see that we can you See where your Jeep is driving, we can connect to it. And reroute it? And, and do all sorts of things. Uh, let's watch the let's wire Let's watch there. the report. Yeah. All right, all the, something just turned on, all the fans and AC and stuff. I didn't do that. The trick started small. Oh my God. That was a picture of Charlie and Chris in track suits that just appeared on the dashboard. But as I drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. Perfect. I can't turn it down. This was such a fun video. Ski Loki can also join tonight. Hey, now the, the air conditioning is blasting, the music is blasting, and I can't see anything because of the f***ing windshield wiper fluid. I gotta do it. Do it. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. It says park it says <laughs> Actually, can't accelerate. Now, it gets worse. It how can, gets how worse. can it get worse? Uh, they take <laughs> okay. him to a parking lot and they show him how they can steer the, uh, steer the, wheel, the wheel and take his car into a ditch. Or, or yeah. in other words, you, you can get killed yeah. by hackers yeah, and, into and your the, Jeep. The interesting thing is that we knew that every car today has a computer right. inside of it, right. which means you can hack it one way or the other. But up until now, we've known that if you'll sit inside the car and you are tech whiz, maybe there's a good chance you can uh, hack into the car, you know, with wires. This is the first time we understand that it's the, the computer inside the car has a modem. And when the car drives, you can detect the car, the specific car, hack into it and do all sorts of weird of things. Really bad things. And after yeah. that, after that report, Jeep had to recall 1.4 million cars. And the government in the United States are looking to investigate into this crisis and see if uh, uh, Jeep will have to pay the you customers. Know, the conspiracy not theorist just in me is already thinking that is this the way that covert operations actually steer people off the road, yeah. or you know. We're looking oh, again the conspiracy yeah. theorist, yeah. you know, who uh, but, not, but still it's but terrifying. It's, yeah, but this is just Jeep. Or most cars have modems and that's, inside that their was computers. my next question. So basically uh, yeah. you can you can hack into any uh, to every car. Um, theoretically. Those, yeah, theoretically. Those hackers found a way to hack into a Jeep Shiroke. And uh, this specific Jeep Shiroke has uh, this specific modem. Which is, uh, but again, theoretically, if any, if yeah. all the cars have a co have a computer, and and we have, we are lucky that these two hackers came to Wired and said, "Look, we'll give you all the information in order for you to do something about, about it." About this, rather than yeah. just yeah, yeah, great, okay. Um, yeah. We're feeling much safer right now yeah. on the roads. I know Daniel Campus is looking very concerned. Maybe it's just the shirt. Uh, I don't but, have a yeah, license. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> okay, yes, moving on. Moving on, okay. Uh, tomorrow is a big day in the tech world, so I wanted to talk about it. Uh, it's exciting. <laughs> For me, at least. Windows Bro, 10. Stop. Yeah, win How do you look like when you're excited? Th this. This is it? Yeah. Okay, that's Th That's it. me very That is you excited. excited. Wow. Yeah. In the morning. <laughs> Windows 10 is launching tomorrow. Microsoft is launching its biggest product. I think ever. <gasps> yeah. Um, that's excitement. Yeah, yeah. that's that's excitement <laughs> so, okay, for okay. you. Yes. Um, Biggest ever. Why is this exciting? And, and this uh, and this is the thing that Microsoft will need desperately to succeed because Microsoft is in a slump, uh, and Windows 10 can maybe potentially change the way we think about personal computers. 
You're not very maybe. optimistic, Shai. I'm not very optimistic because Microsoft is so trying everything. Um, we have a video yeah, clip of, a of video. the ad, the cute ad. The, the cute ad. Yeah. Let's take a look at what they're launching. Imagine, these kids won't have to remember passwords or obsess about security. For them, every screen is meant to be touched, and web pages are meant to be scribbled on and shared. They'll expect their devices to listen to them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Daniel, cute. help me out here. All I got out of this is happy kids. Yeah, happy kids. But those, <laughs> what Microsoft <laughs> is trying to say, no, no, no. Yeah. happy kids. Look no, at no. It. But what my. What Microsoft is trying to say here yeah, is that... The world will be just screens. Uh, you may don't understand what we are trying to do, but kids do, because <laughs> they were born to the new generation that we are bringing to Windows 10. Windows 10 will be this marvelous thing where uh, you don't think about a different operation, uh, operation uh, operating system on your phone, on your tablet, on your PC. Everything will be the same. Windows 10 is the first operating system that will work on your console, on your phone, on your tablet, and of course on your PC. And uh, those kids won't understand the differences between all those things because... It's a one-stop shop. Yeah, they'll think about how they can touch the screen and touch the web. And, you know, the, uh, Microsoft I mean, truth is... be told, the genius of that, because all I'm getting from, from this commercial is that my two-year-old, okay, when she was a year and a half, walked up to the television screen in the yeah. living room and tried to do this. Yeah. Okay? So and at, at one point I said, no, this is not how you make this work. And then I thought, but this is how it will work most likely yeah, in and, five and years. Yeah, and now Microsoft yeah. are bringing this operating system to your TV, not just to your personal computer. And this is My the big idea. Yeah, yeah, this is the big idea that Microsoft is trying to sell. And they're saying, look, old people, <laughs> who, who are using computers, you may don't understand a glorious new product which needs to change the world. But your kid but does. But your kid does. And, and this means that we are the future. This is the first time Microsoft is actually trying to... They did it before in the 90s, but this is... For, uh, for a long time, Microsoft has been, you know, lagging, lagging behind. behind. And now yeah. they are the future. Kids will understand them. They'll, they don't need to think about passwords and all sorts of things. And uh, Windows 10 uh, will uh, be also with a personal assistant, like Siri. It's called Con Contra. Con okay. Uh, um, so these kids will talk to their computers. No, no, I get it. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the test of this matter is to actually for all us parents to just take one home when it comes out and see if the kids understand it. And if yeah. not, yeah, <laughs> there we have it. Shai Ringen, thank you. Thank you. You're locked in studio um, with us because it is the time to move to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> we're, actually, we're actually moving to Iran. To Iran, yes. You actually have a very interesting report for us today. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to talk a bit about the, the human rights violations uh, towards the Baha'i community in Iran. Because there are not enough people to you, you to you know submit submit under human rights um, uh, violations in Iran. Okay. Uh, perhaps we can start out with the report first, and then we can discuss. Let's take a look. Baha'i history begins with the Bab's declaration in Shiraz on the evening of May 22nd of 1844. The Bab proclaimed himself to be the return of the hidden 12th Imam. As the Babi movement spread in Iran, violence broke out between the ruling Shia Muslim government and the Babis, and ended up when government troops massacred the Babis and executed the Bab in 1850. The Bab had spoken of another messianic figure, he whom God shall make manifest. One of the exiled followers of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, in 1863 in Baghdad, claimed to be the messianic figure expected by the Bab's writings. All these founding figures of the Baha'i faith are currently buried in the Baha'i gardens of northern Israel, in Haifa and Akko. From the beginning, Baha'is have been seen as apostates from Islam. And according to some Islamists, they must choose between repentance and death. Since the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, Baha'is are also accused of being Zionist agents for having their world center in Haifa. Today, there are over 100 Baha'is jailed in Iran because of their religion. They're the country's largest non-minority religious group, frequently harassed by security services and wrongly imprisoned. They're discriminated against in employment, 
obstructed from earning a livelihood, with their holy sites destroyed and their cemeteries desecrated. The Baha'is have also been denied access to higher education since 1981. Still in effect today is a 1991 secret memorandum of the Supreme Revolutionary Cultural Council authored by the Iranian government, stating they must be expelled from universities once it's known they are Baha'i. In 2008, seven Baha'i leaders were arrested and put on trial at Branch 28 of the Tehran Revolutionary Court. In 2010, Iran promised the Human Rights Council to improve the situation, but instead, violations of human rights against a minority have intensified, as many nations move towards a more optimistic relationship with Iran. The story of Baha'is reminds the international community of Iran's failures to fulfill its promises to grant human rights to many of its citizens, especially its minorities. Wow, Daniel Campus. I mean, first of all, the Baha'i religion, in which, you know, it, it's very small all around the world, but doing this report, what did you learn about them, not just in Iran? Uh, well, you know, Baha'i is nothing new for me. Uh, it's quite bizarre. I was raised in Mexico and in Costa Rica, and my parents always had Persian Baha'i friends who were actually refugees. You know? Really? Uh, there's a very big Persian Baha'i refugee community worldwide. You can worldwide. find them in the U.S., and also right. they've been trying to flee Iran for many years. Uh, according to the U.S. Embassy, they try to make it easier for Baha'is. Uh, when they go and ask for a visa, they know their situation is very, obviously, bad over there. Uh, they, they've suffered persecution throughout their history. All of the Baha'i, the main Baha'i leaders have been in prison uh, from beginning to today. The Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha was in prison in Akko, in yeah. the same prison where a lot of the Etzel, we can say uh, fighters of, uh, who fought for the independence of Israel were also in jail. But he was in prison there during the Ottoman period in the early 1900s. During the British pr period, the British mandate, they were a bit easier on the Baha'is, who were more respectful, obviously, towards them. Uh, it is believed that, for example, uh, Haj Amin al Husseini Haj was not a fan of the Baha'is. There is said that there's even a fatwa. Uh, against the Baha'is. He did not like Shoghi Effendi, the grandson of Abdul Baha, which was basically the man who took over the religion. A fatwa meaning, I'm um, just explaining to you, sadly, that everybody knows these days, a decree to kill by law of, um, of religion. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, well, Baha'is were, according to the 1948 partition of Israel, Baha'is Baha are apolitical. And here they have no word. They're not pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. They, they have no saying in any pol politics True. wherever in any country of the world. And in 1948, they came and they proposed to the Baha'is. Uh, they told them, uh, you're going to be, uh, on the 1948 original partition, you'll be part of a Palestinian state. Uh, and then the, the independence happened, and they ended up in the Israeli side. On the Israeli side. side. And maybe, for, like I said, if Haj Amin al-Husseini wasn't a fan of them, then they were lucky. But they never, they didn't choose this. Uh, Baha'i leadership actually is quite interesting. They meet not every 19 days in someone's home to talk about their religion, to pray together. And that's why it's very easy for the Iranian government to accuse them of being spies or... or because there are gatherings of, of dozens of people who are sitting together and, wow. Well, and yeah. praying. No, no, which, which is very sad. I mean, it's also important to mention, and plus having the, the shrines, I think, if you are of the region of the Middle East, you always know of the shrine, the Baha'i shrine in Haifa, um, which is a marvelous, beautiful, beautiful place, but a very, a very, you know, small religion Indeed. that not too many people know about, and it's very easy to discriminate against such. Um, that's ending the show on a happy note. Thank you, Daniel. Um, but, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but for that, we have Shai Ringo, who is not Baha'i, right? Mm. No, you're not Baha'i, okay. Um, but I do want to thank our lovely men in their blue shirts um, sitting with us this morning in studio. And, of course, do not forget to check us out, I-24 News Morning Edition on Facebook, Twitter, all those social networks, and tune in tomorrow morning to start your day with the Morning Edition, the place you should be because you get to see Shai Ringel. Now, stay, stick around for the news. <laughs>